for your teaching. Show us that working with one another is our best way forward. And that serving you and all our brothers and sisters is our clearest and most prudent path toward progress. May your light, your guidance, and your blessings always be upon us as we serve you gratefully. In your name, we pray. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much, Senator. For the recitation of Indifrasi, Senator Frank Bloss, can you lead us? Thank <laughs> Esti fit make he lived For the singing of the Guam hymn in Chamorro, Senator Frank Ogden, if you can lead us with that, and the singing of the national anthem is Senator McCready, if you can lead us with that. Thank you, Senators. The clerk can please take roll call. Senator Tom Adda. Senator Tony Adda. Senator Uggen. Senator Blas. Vice Speaker Cruz. Senator Espaldon. Senator McCready. Senator Morrison. Senator Munya Barnes. Senator Respicio. Senator Rodriguez. Here. Senator Sir Nicholas. Here. Senator Torres. Senator Underwood. Here. Speaker Wampat. Yes, degrees. Madam Speaker, there is a quorum. Thank you very much. Senator Respicio, you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I move that we excuse Senator Torres from session. Hearing objections, so order. 
Thank you. I move that we approve the legislative journal dated January 29 and February 8, 2016, both subject to correction. No objection, so ordered. M Madam Speaker, there are communications and petitions that I move that they be appended to today's session journal. No objection, so ordered. As well as messages from Imagalah and Guahan, I move that they also be appended to today's session journal. No objection, so ordered. And there are reports of standing committees, and I move for the same. No objections ordered. Thank you. And there being no reports of select committees, I move that under the introduction and first reading of bills, resolution, and certificates, bill numbers 231-33LS through 240-33LS, bill numbers 241-33COR to 253-33COR, resolution numbers 261-33LS through 270-33LS, Resolution numbers 271-33-COR through 282-33-COR. Uh, certificate number 109-33-LS to through 112-33-LS. And certificate numbers 113-33-COR through 118-33-COR. All be given its first reading. Hearing objections, order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, under motions, I move that any resolution or certificate of commendatory or condolence in nature that's introduced for uh, the duration of this call to session, that it be adopted, that all, call, all senators be co-sponsors, and that the uh, sponsors work with the clerk and the legal counsel in the preparation of these documents, but that they be automatically approved. Hearing objection, so ordered. And my um, next motion is we had just um, provided copies and uh, this is another bill that uh, I'd like to move to place on the agenda and it's bill 213-33 COR is amended by the Committee on Higher Education, Culture, Public Libraries and Women's Affairs and it's been introduced by Senator Snickless and it's an act to amend uh, section 2 of Public Law 32-114 relative to authorizing the University of Guam to assign employees to RCUOG for up to five years with the retention of University of Guam employee benefits. And the committee report uh, has been filed for some time now, and then I move that this be um, placed in the session agenda in um, numerical order wherever it falls in, in this agenda. Hearing objections, so order. Madam Speaker, another um, motion is a motion that provides you the ability to manage this uh, very aggressive session agenda that was set uh, through the Committee on Rules that if any time we're at a bill or a resolution and that the sponsor requires more time uh, in the preparation of getting more data that's requested of that person, that uh, that bill be set aside, not lose its place on the agenda, but it be set aside uh, in order to allow you to move to the next uh, bill. And until such time the sponsor is ready to go back, uh, then then you would be able to um, to manage that without having to, to do a notwithstanding motion to reorder the agenda. Okay. Hope everyone is listening. No objections. So, so and the other thing, Madam Speaker, as you pointed out, that all uh, bills that are being discussed in the second reading, if the senators can, uh, in advance, prepare their floor amendments uh, so that the legal counsel can begin to look at those floor amendments, uh, whether or not they've been even uh, discussed uh, on the floor, but at least they have a head start in, in uh, moving these bills and resolutions forward. I think that would help uh, expedite things for the coming days. Thank you. No objections ordered. Madam Speaker, um, also I've been told that the sponsors of the two bills that were vetoed by the governor that hopefully an override attempt will be made uh, tomorrow. So just want to notice the body that we would begin to address bills in the second reading file. However, tomorrow morning uh, I would make a notwithstanding motion to revert back to motions for the purposes of expediting uh, uh, those initiatives. So just want to put that out there so that nobody uh, acts surprised when we go back to motions. Then the other, um, there are no other motions, Madam Speaker, but I'd like to proceed to legislative concurrence. Yes, please proceed. Thank you. There's uh, seven uh, items in the legislative concurrence, but four of them still uh, are pending the submission of a committee report. These committee reports have been uh, done. They've been, are being circulated. But before I can make the motion to put them on the voting file, uh, certainly they have to be uploaded on our website. So at this time, I'm going to just move items one, five, and six, and I'll read them. Item one is from your, com your Committee on Higher Education, Culture, Public Libraries, and Women's Affairs on the nomination of Frank Pariola to serve as a member of the Guam Community College Board of Trustees 
With your committee's recommendation to confirm, I move that that be placed in the voting file. So ordered. And on item five, uh, the committee on higher education, same committee, uh, on the nomination of Gina Ramos to serve as a member of the same board, the GCC Board of Trustees, with your committee's recommendation to confirm, I move that be placed in the voting file. So ordered. And from Senator Dennis Rodriguez, his committee on health, economic development, homeland security, and senior citizens, on the nomination of John Rojas to serve as administrator of GITA, uh, with the committee's recommendation to confirm, I move that be placed in the voting file. So ordered. So also, Madam Speaker, for items two, three, four, and seven, if I may be permitted to uh, make those motions after we're done with motions uh, tomorrow morning. So just also appreciate your support and being able to do that. And just for, um, for the body's um, uh, bookmark, there's a bill on the second reading file. I think it's 227, right? Yeah. Bill 227, introduced by Senator Barnes. Uh, I guess it was decided in rules that uh, the sponsor of this bill will break this bill up into nine different bills. And so, we, again, we would be able to address that once those individual bills have been introduced this morning. Okay, so I have no other um, motions. No. Yeah, and also pen pending the submission of a committee report. Yes. For those bills, right? 227? Yeah, Madam Speaker, we do have um, uh, a sheet uh, that's pr been provided to us by the clerk, that's you and me, that tracks all the committee reports that are still pending. And so just for purposes of uh, letting the public and the media and our colleagues know, we never proceed to the discussion of these various uh, second reading items unless the committee report has been filed and loaded, uh, uploaded on the website. So, yes. okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Spicio. On the second reading file, rec the chair recognizes Senator Frank Uggen Jr. on bill number 89-33, LS. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and good morning to you and to our fellow colleagues. Madam Speaker, I'd like to move for the placement of bill number 89-33, LS, as reported out by the committee into the third reading file for cons consideration by the body. So that's, that is as substituted by? As substituted by the Committee on U.S. Guam Military Relocation, Public Safety, and Judiciary. Okay, as substituted. Senator, you may proceed. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, just for the information of the public, this is relative to the composition of the Guam Parole Board. And what it would provide, this is a... Uh, let me backtrack. This is a direct request from members of the parole board as well as the Department of Corrections, and their request is reflected in the committee report. Madam Speaker, a few years back, uh, this body had considered expanding the membership of the parole board from five to seven, and also inserted some additional requirements in terms of the qualifications for these members. Unfortunately, uh, as a result of the last several years, looking at the attendance and the number of quorums that have been, or official meetings that have been held, there have been a good number of meetings that were canceled as a result of not having a quorum. So this would propose to reduce the number of membership from seven to five, and then correspondingly allow for the quorum to reflect from four to three. Madam Speaker, I say this in light of understanding that, that we certainly want as many people involved in the deliberation of any individual that is being considered for parole. But we also need to ensure that the body and the membership is able to carry out their actions. And in light of that, I want to commend and to thank the five individuals who are presently uh, active members of the board who have been serving for a number of years. You look at the challenges, and I'll, I'll just highlight the number of meetings that were canceled as a result of no quorum. In 2011, there were nine meetings, nine months between the months of April and December, where in fact, there were no meetings held because of a lack of quorum. In 2012, there were three months, January, May, and November. In 2013, six months, from January to May, and inclusive of September. 
In 2014, there were three months between March, June, and July. And in 2015, my understanding is that there were two months when, in fact, the parole board were not able to meet as a result of quorum. Uh, the, just for the information of members of this body, the chairwoman, Ms. Taitanu, is presently in the public hearing room, and I've asked her to make herself available if by any chance any of our members would like to ask a question of her in the public hearing room. But, Madam Speaker, it's self-explanatory. I want to say this much, though. I know that there's been some sidebar discussions about perhaps... Uh, looking at other ways in which we can sustain the present number and allow for individuals who are sitting in a particular position to be able to also join the serve in this parole board. That is, is a consideration, Madam Speaker, and I certainly encourage any deliberation or discussions in terms of expanding the law, but I think uh, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to ensure that at least the opportunity be given to the parole board to continue to act with a quorum moving forward. So, Madam Speaker, I ask for the consideration of members of this body, and I'll, I'll close with this. The one question is, okay, so who's at, who's at fault in terms of not getting sufficient appointees? To me, I'm not even gonna discuss that. I am looking at the process. I am looking at individuals who may have been asked, and unfortunately, so far, only five individuals have volunteered to serve, and I say to serve on the parole board, and I literally say volunteer, Madam Speaker, because the parole board at this point in time is receiving zero compensation from the government of Guam for the services that they pro provide. And I'm, I'm not going to correlate compensation with attendance, but I'm just saying that literally these five individuals who have accepted the responsibility to serve in this capacity have been volunteering for our community, and I commend them and I thank them for that, and, and I certainly hope that we can move forward, not only addressing this, but perhaps consider other options that will be available so that in fact we can include additional participation in any deliberation under the parole board. So I, I ask our colleagues to please consider supporting this measure. Thank you. You're welcome, Senator. On the motion, Senator McCready, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, um, I echo the sentiments of the, the previous speaker and the author, and I congratulate him on this bill. You know, when you look at the bill, we go from seven members to five members, and then the, the quorum would be three now. And as, as, the, as the author of the bill said, we, we would, this, is a very, this is a very important piece of legislation because these are the eyes that that either keep convicted offenders in jail or let them out into the general public. When doing that, I think, personally, you should have more eyes on, on, these, on these individuals and, and more opinions on to who should or should not be released back into the general public. And there are some positive messages on uh, page one because from 2011 to 2015, we went to only one missed meeting uh, due to a lack of quorum, if I'm understanding it correctly. We had nine in 2011, three in 2012, six in 2013, three in 2014, and one in 2015. But there has to be a better way to find a solution to this problem. This right here, I think, is something that may have to be done immediately as a Band-Aid option. But there has to be something that, that works for this entire community that ha has a longer lasting effect on, on, on our island. And I think, you know, like, like, the, like the author said, this, this piece of legislation right here might not be the long-term solution that we need. My other question, well, my first question would be, and I, I don't know if this is for the author or this is for the, um, the parole board, but when we have these lack of quorum meetings and we have to cancel them, does that affect the, the status of the offender who has the possibility of getting out? And so is, is that a bottleneck to our 
to our, to our prison system, which then would add an extra financial burden on the government. So I, I, there, there's some problems that could arise from letting someone out too early because you, you don't have enough eyes on them. But there are also problems if you're not letting the person out at all because you don't have a quorum, and then that, that becomes the responsibility of the government. So I don't know who's, who's, who's going to answer that question, but is there a fiscal disadvantage to also not having a quorum? And if so, I'd like to, to know, what, you know what kind of numbers that is. Senator Dragon, do you yield to the question? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my understanding of the question is if, in fact, there's no quorum, is there a bottleneck of, of outstanding concerns and issues that are brought before the board? And I would have my initial inclination is yes. Uh, but I have to commend the board because as of March of last year, they had caught up to most of the pending items and it's contained in the committee report and it was stated by the chair that they, they were current as of that timeline in terms of addressing most of the concerns. So, so in, in this case, although it may directly affect that, I think it's, it's only best that we allow this board to continue to entertain any requests that, that come forward. So that's in response to his question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And you know that I, I, would, I would like to see the numbers, because if you, if you, re if you reflect on the I numbers. think Senator Ogden did mention that the chair is in the committee room. If those of you that have questions have questions of the committee, I mean of the com parole board, the chair is in, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, com committee room and would be willing to answer questions. Thank you. I note that the public hearing on this was almost a year ago, and so the stats may be not current. If you want to know what the current stats are, you may need to to speak to the chair. So I will, I will put this aside for a okay. second, go to the next bill and allow the two of you that have questions. I know both of you have questions that might be proposed to the, to the, to the, to the chairman of the, com the uh, commission, um, I mean the parole board, and then we, we can move on, okay? Uh, Senator Frank Bloss, you're recognized on Bill 149. I mean, Senator Tony Abbott. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I ask for the indulgence of the body to consider a floor substitution on Bill 149.33. And uh, it was at the hearing of the bill that uh, the AG pointed out that the bill might be interpreted to hold all legal guardians civilly liable for the acts of their children. And uh, while, you know, while no courts have ruled that way in similar language laws, it was still a valid concern that I felt had to be addressed. And also at the hearing, the Also at the hearing was a concern that the uh, old Ex pre-civil rights excuse act. Excuse me a second. Um. The motion is to accept the substituted version. Is that correct? Yes. Any objection to accepting the substituted version? You may continue, Senator Adams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to um, make a motion to place uh, Bill 149 as substituted by the author on the floor into the third reading file. Speak on the bill, please. There being no objection, continue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, once again at the hearing of the, of the bill, of the original, as introduced, Bill 149, you know, the AG pointed out um, that the bill might be interpreted to hold all legal guardians civilly liable for the acts of their children. 
And also, another concern that was pointed out was the old uh, Pre-Civil Rights Act of 1964, a law that was, uh, that's in, in 18 GCA Chapter 90, that might conflict with the proposed law. The law allowed the, primarily the federal and local government and churches to recover up to $500 from children who maliciously damage schools, government units, and churches. That law was only amended once when it was, uh, since its enactment in 1965, and that was from $500 to $1,000. You know, and um, when, when the public hearing was held in September 1st, there was supposed to be a markup meeting. We were supposed to have a markup meeting with the Attorney General. And however, we weren't able to meet with her when the, when the bill was reported out on October 1st. And since then though, you know, since October 1st, I've met with the AG and she was amenable to the changes that would replace the old institutional vandalism law in 18 GCA and exempt foster parents from those temporary, and those with temporary custody of minors from liability. Mr. Speaker, as you know, in, in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, American Samoa, they all have act, enacted statutory law that holds parents civilly liable for actual and tort damages of certain acts committed by their children. And although the amounts of liability in other jurisdictions range from a minimum of $1,000 to an unlimited amount, uh, no state holds parents without complicity criminally liable for their children's crime in such laws as it would be unlike, you know, unconstitutional. By enacting Bill 149.33, it follows on the sentiments of the rest of the country that we as a community, we take the duties of parental responsibility seriously. When I was at the Department of Youth Affairs, I heard it time and time and time again that there are no bad kids, it's just the parenting. And this bill, which is patterned after California's parental liability law, will mean that it will be more costly if parents do not take their parental responsibility seriously and ensure that they always know where their children are and what their children are doing. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to uh, get this bill passed and signed into law, and I ask my colleagues for their support. Thank you. Any senator wish to be heard on Bill 149 as substituted by the author on the floor? Any senator, Senator Tom Mehta? Sen senator Espaldon, you're recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. In light that this has just been uh, introduced right now or, you know, as substituted right now, I haven't had a chance to really reflect upon some of the issues that the uh, uh, Attorney General has, has essentially stated, the concerns that she stated with the original bill as introduced. And I'm just basically asking for a little uh, time to take a look at yes, what the substitution Yes, legal counsel has asked for some time, too. Um, uh, we'll, we'll set this aside again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Senator Rodriguez on Bill 185. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can I ask that we um, pass this and come back to it perhaps after lunch? I want to provide you. the body with a substitute version okay. so they can review. Thank you. Senator McCready. Oh no, Senator St. Nicholas. Two two eight. Senator St. Nicholas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to make a motion to place bill number 228 on the third reading file and have an opportunity to speak on the measure. 
That would be two two eight as substituted by the committee. Yes, yes, Mr. Speaker, substituted by the committee on appropriations and adjudication. There being no objection, hearing no objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bill number two two eight dash thirty three is an act to authorize that basically any revenue in excess of what we budgeted for back in October will go into the income tax refund efficient payment trust account uh, for us to be able to use those funds for the payment of tax refunds. Um, it also restricts any additional appropriations um, for the fiscal year from any of these funding sources uh, for any other purpose <clears throat> other than to go in and, and fund the refund trust account. And the reason, Mr. Speaker, why I'm introdu introducing this bill is because as we've recently found um, in the um, joint oversight hearing that we both chaired together, uh, the tax refund account at the time only had about $235 in it. They still had over a million dollars in refunds owed for 2015, and we were already entering the 2016 tax refund season. Um, there is a law on the books that requires a certain percentage of the revenues of the government of Guam to be immediately deposited into the refund trust account in order to pay tax refunds as they come due. And that amount is um, at, the, at the least $14 million short to date. And uh, as we come into tax refund season all over again, in spite of the fact that we have these laws in the books intended to provide the resources to make um, payments as quickly as possible, we find ourselves once again in a situation where that fund is underfunded and as refunds get filed and as they get processed and as the um, individuals wait for their checks, we're going to surely run up to the same situation we did last year and in all the years prior where we did not borrow, we're going to find people waiting for their tax refunds. And <clears throat> while, <clears throat> excuse me, we're currently under a court order that would allow for refunds to be paid within six months from the deadline to file. Um, we really shouldn't be having our people wait six months. The um, tax refunds in the states get paid within two weeks or up to a month and no more than that. And that is ultimately, I believe, um, a standard that we should be striving for. So as we develop our budgets at the beginning of the fiscal year, those budgets are based on what we anticipate the entire government is going to need in order to operate. We um, base it on projections that we eventually come to an agreement on is going to be met throughout the course of the fiscal year. And as the year progresses, in the event that it looks like there's additional revenue, what has been the practice in the past is that revenue will get appropriated for something above and beyond what we originally budgeted for. And we've done that many, many times in almost every single legislature. <clears throat> in spite of that, we still have this tax refund situation that just always seems to get put off to the last minute waiting for huge chunks of money to come in, whether it's um, uh, GRT is getting filed last minute and the business license deadline in June, or Section 30 money coming in at the last minute in August to uh, all of a sudden infuse the system with cash and get those payouts going. And in the meantime, we develop a, a spending habit within um, the body where we budget the beginning of the fiscal year, we spend excess revenue throughout the fiscal year, but we always make the tax refunds wait until the last minute. And so what this law will do, Madam Speaker, is it will basically say that we will not be appropriating excess revenue um, until tax refunds are all paid. And all that excess revenue that gets projected into the budget because we're looking, we're looking at a, a higher revenue um, environment will go into that trust fund and it will go to paying tax refunds first. And until we get ourselves to a point where we're paying within two weeks or at the very least paying within 30 days, um, that's uh, something that I really think we should be striving for. And this, bi this bill will then make all of us come to a conclusion if we do vote to pass it, which I hope we do, that yes, we do have government priorities and yes, the government budget will be increasing as the needs of the community increase, but we will be addressing that during the budget season and provisioning for that at the beginning of every fiscal year. And everything else thereafter should be going to making our current liabilities um, as on time as possible and in this instance, what Bill 228-33 will do, as substituted by the committee, will make sure that we are first prioritizing the full funding of tax refunds so that our people don't have to wait six months and if that court order gets overturned, even longer than that. So I humbly ask all of my colleagues to please consider Bill 228-33. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You're welcome.
on the motion? Does anyone like to speak? Senator Blosh, you're recognized. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, I, well, I, uh, I, you know, I have to agree with uh, with the author of the legislation of the priority or you know of the concern with regards to the tax refunds. I think I also need to remind the body that during the uh, budget process that we went through um, for this this fiscal year's budget, um, there was, for lack of a better term an understanding and a promise, if you will, that we're going to take a look at where we are and as far as the finances after the, basically the first two quarters and then make the adjustments accordingly. And, um, you know, while I, again, like I said, I, while I agree with the author on, on this, I, I'm just a little concerned with regards to the handcuffing that we're going to be placing on ourselves as well as the, the, the operations of the government. Um, and I would prefer to see probably more in the line of a priority on this thing and an, an affirmed priority, uh, you know, with regards to the, the utilizations of the rev any revenues that are projected above and beyond what we've already uh, or received above and beyond what we've projected. You know, it. it, it I'm, I'm a little concerned too with regards to on page two, line nine, starting on line nine, when it says, notwithstanding any of the provisions of the law to the contrary. I'm a little concerned as to what provision of law are we referring to with regards to the notwithstanding. And um, if I can ask, beg the indulgence, it would yield, if, the, if the author could yield to you know, the necessity of that language, of the notwithstanding. Senator Sinclair, do you yield to the question, which is on page two, line nine, the notwithstanding clause? Um, yes, Madam Speaker, we can, we can reconsider that. Um, and have the sentence start with any revenues projected to be or actually collected in FY 2016? Because I can see where the, um, the uh, inquirer is um, concerned that perhaps if there is any um, appropriations that happened prior to the passage of this bill that have not yet been encumbered or expended, it may potentially cancel out some of those appropriations. I actually might be okay with doing that because I'm that much of a hawk when it comes to prioritizing the refunds. But I can understand how some of my colleagues may be a little bit concerned about that because it was already a commitment that passed through this body. So if this is something that um, the inquirer would like to strike from the words notwithstanding to the end of the word contrary, um, I can go ahead and be amenable to that, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Senator Blush, you still have the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate, you know, the, the, you know and uh, the move from, or the offer from the author. And, and it goes to say, I was a little concerned with regards to that, that provision and, and, you know, I move then to, to as was stated um, by the author, to move to strike basically notwithstanding any other provision of the law to the contrary. Okay. On that uh, amendment to strike on page 2, lines 9 and 10, the words notwithstanding any other provision of the law to the contrary, and that sentence then for that particular section will start with any, any objections? No objections? So ordered. Senators, to have the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And if you move to page three, um, basically section four, line six, six section four, uh, appropriation restriction. Again, Madam Speaker, I agree and I, have, you know, and, I, and I recognize and I understand the concerns of the author. My concern here is that I don't want to have to handcuff us, handcuff us in the event that something occurs and now we don't have the ability to be able to, res to, to respond accordingly. Okay. And um, I, I have to question the 
whether or not it's organic to be able to do this. Uh, you know, Madam Speaker, while we cannot predict, and we can't predict what's going to be happening over the next few months within the remainder of this fiscal year, um, and if something were to occur, I'm speaking to the choir here with regards to the, will, the, you know, the wills that have to be placed in motion to be able to respond, much less now we're going to have to go back and fix things, go back and, and, and undo some things just so that we can have the access, the ability to be able to access the funds. I continue to, see, you know, to, 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 to recognize that if it's an excess and we haven't, you know, the revenues were in excess and we haven't budgeted for it, just put it in there. But don't r restrict it when it, again, I don't want anything to happen and knock on wood then nothing does happen. It's just, again, my concern is basically with the, basically with the whole section and taking away this, this body's ability to be able to react and respond accordingly. So, you know, Madam Speaker, um, for those concerns that I just raised, um, Sir, do you have an I need to move to strike section four. There is uh, an amendment then to strike section four in its entirety. On the amendment, I have Senator uh, Rodriguez and then Senator St. Nicholas. Good morning, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise in um, support of the amendment to strike section four in its entirety. Um, you know, I was going to speak on, on the, um, the main motion, but um, perhaps I can tie it into this, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, we, we passed a, a budget that we've um, all here agreed that was a balanced budget, had a provision for tax refunds, which was $125 million, which we set aside. And now we're saying that um, if we have excess of revenue as per what we have already passed, then we're going to... Um, we're going to put it into that uh, category once again. Um, you know, and we've, we've gone down this road, Madam Speaker, about the difference between the appropriations, uh, because we can appropriate to the moon, to the stars and the moon, uh, but the actual cash is what is, is really what, what, will, um, what will drive the, um, you know, the actual um, expenditures, right? And, and, and whatever we, we appropriate, and so, my concern here, Madam Speaker, that it, it really restricts our ability, this legislature, future legislature's ability to take a look at the other uh, priorities in our government that, that need attention. Um, the good mover of this amendment to delete talked about what if something comes up in the future. Well, there, you know, there are things already today, Madam Speaker, that need our attention. We've talked about um, uh, the need to, to really look at the challenges of the Guam Memorial Hospital. Um, and, and look at how we can really um, support them. They have a, a growing amount of uh, vendor payables um, to the tune, I believe, of over $25 million as of today. Um, and, and this is where really we can make the greatest impact, Madam Speaker, in terms of um, providing that support to the hospital. I know that others have talked about um, perhaps um, um, looking at other, you know, at other avenues of um, looking at cutting um, pay that uh, we had um, 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 some have proffered here, cutting the legislature's pay, and you will save 300, was it 400 thousand dollars a year? Well, that's not going to um, be able to provide that immediate assistance to the hospital, um, because if we want to go down that path of looking at um, pay of elected leaders, of appointed leaders, well, we got to look at the whole picture and look at how are are these um, um, branches of government. On spending, you know, taxpayers' money, not just in salary, but in in, in other in other expenses of, of operation. So, and I, I know I'm kind of deviating from um, from this, but it just all ties in. It all ties into the fact that us, um, if we do pass this measure that has this section that restricts this legislature from looking at what the 
um, the, the challenges are of the government, um, you know, when and when that point does come up, and I've referenced at least one with the Guam Memorial Hospital Authority, it really ties our hands. It ties our hands. It ties the hands of the future legislatures to address the needs of our community. So I rise in uh, support of the amendment. Thank you, Senator. Senator Nicholas, you're recognized on the amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this amendment is probably one of the, the key portions, if not the most key portion of the entire bill. What Section 4 says is that you cannot appropriate money in excess of what we budgeted. You cannot appropriate that for any other purpose other than the payment of tax refunds over the course of the fiscal year. That's just so important to this entire piece of legislation, Madam Speaker, because what this bill does is it says if we budget, let's say, 600 million in October, and we bring in 650 million, that extra 50 million must first go to pay tax refunds before we go and appropriate anything else. Now, if we pay the tax refunds in full, then of course you can go and appropriate that money for any other purpose. But until tax refunds, the obligations to pay tax refunds are fully um, retired, we really should have no business appropriating for any other purpose. We really should have no business appropriating for any other purpose because tax refunds aren't the government's money. It's the people's money. If we appropriate that money for something else, we're telling the people, we're not giving you your money back. We're going to go and make something else be a priority other than the refund that you're owed. That's what's gotten us into so much trouble, Madam Speaker. We do that all the time. It creates the deficit. We go out and we borrow to pay it off. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars with interest that really adds up to billions or a billion plus. We've all seen the article where in every single administration at some point or another, to some degree or another, we've had to go to the bond market to borrow to pay this obligation off. Amazingly, in spite of that history, we still have the administration trying to go and overturn that very court decision that keeps us within the six-month time limitation. And all of that aside, this particular section, Madam Speaker, basically says, look, we budget what we know the government's going to need at the beginning of the fiscal year. If anything extra comes in, direct that into tax refunds directed into tax refunds because that's our primary obligation. Give the people back the money they are owed. Now the question comes up, what if something comes up? What if something new in the government, the hospital or whatever? The governor can always declare a state of emergency. I'm actually amazed that he, that he hasn't done so already up there. When you see the trash piling up on the outside of the agency and it becomes a public health hazard at the hospital, I mean, declare the state of emergency, then all the different mechanisms kick in organically, organically, to be able to address those emergency situations. And then when you declare that emergency, all of us can look our people in the eye and say, yes, we owe you your refunds, we have the legislation in place to prioritize that, but if an emergency has been declared, this is something that affects the health and welfare of our community, but we're gonna get right back to those refunds as soon as that emergency is ameliorated. That's the way this is all supposed to work, Madam Speaker. If we take this section out, we're leaving the door wide open for everything else to all of a sudden become more of a priority than tax refunds. And don't get me wrong, there are so many, there's so many. But what we need to start doing in this government is prioritizing. And the tax refunds, the money we owe back to the people, should be at the top of that list because this is their money. All of us would love to be the ones to appropriate for you know, fixing a road or addressing some other outstanding issue. We, we see them coming through almost every session in appropriation for something or another. Lately, I've been voting no on all these appropriations because of these re the, this reality that we're facing in the tax refund situation because we have to commit to turning that reality around. And the only way we can commit to doing that is if we make sure that every dollar in excess of what we budget for goes back to the people who we owe. 
And until we can begin to prioritize the way we have funds flowing through this government, until we can prioritize that way, everything's going to just be based on how we feel at the time. How much of a case can we make for this appropriation or that appropriation? How many people can we get to come in and testify in favor of this other priority or this you know, other situation? And in the end, you know, I mean, with the advent of social media, all of us, all of us hear it all the time. When are the refunds coming out? When are the refunds coming out? Are the refunds going to be able to be paid on time? How much longer are we going to have to wait? Is it going to be faster than it was last year? And if we do not close the loophole of appropriating money in excess of what we budget, then really to be able to tell those people, yeah, we're working on it, we're working on it, is just saying, we're working on it, but something else came up, something else came up, something else came up. <clears throat> So there is an emergency, Madam Speaker. The mechanisms are already in place for an emergency to be declared and for those situations to be addressed in that fashion. Absent an emergency, we then need to fall back on what our priorities are. And our first and primary obligation should be to our people, getting the money back that they deserve. That's, that's their money. And retire that obligation. Once that's paid off, once that's paid off, we can go and appropriate for it anything else. But this basically says, Nothing in excess of what we budgeted for should go to any other priority. We need to start falling to the other side of the line, Madam Speaker. We've been doing things this way for this long, and it's been resulting in the same kind of, of outcome for our people. We've needed the courts to kind of change that reality. It's time for us to start erring more on the side of, hey, you know what? We're actually going to put what you want first and what your priorities are first and what we owe you first. Even to the point where we're going to commit, at least in this 33rd Guam legislature, to not spending more than we have already budgeted for because we're going to make it go to you first. And the really good thing about doing it this way, Madam Speaker, is if somebody, if somebody still wants to be able to appropriate for something other than tax refunds, we always can. But then it would have to be a clear piece of legislation that would clearly sidestep this limitation. So I asked my colleagues, leave, let's leave section four in there. Let's make it very, very clear to our people that we're going to be demonstrating a new sense of priority here. That tax refunds and the money we owe you is going to come before anything else unless there's a state of emergency. That should be fundamental to how we spend the people's money, and it should especially be the norm when it comes to money in excess of what we've budgeted for. If there's a priority to address going forward, we can always budget for it in the upcoming budget and take care of it in October. But so long as we have people waiting for their tax refunds, and especially now when we know the realities of the tax refund trust account only having 200 some dollars in there and being millions of dollars short, surely, surely we need to get the people their money as quickly as possible by being able to discipline ourselves and say, you know what guys, we're going to pass this, we're going to leave this intact, and we're not going to appropriate any money in excess of what we've budgeted for because we all agree that tax refunds need to be the priority. That's basically the decision that we're faced with here with this section, and I humbly ask my colleagues to vote no on the amendment to strike. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You're welcome, Senator. On the amendment to delete uh, section four in its entirety, Senator Spaudan, you recognize. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I definitely have so many areas of agreement with the previous retiring speaker. I mean, when it comes to tax refunds and whatnot. However, he, he did mention that once we collect, uh, according to this bill, at least as he, as he stated, 
that once we collect and pay off all the refunds, then any excess can then be appropriated towards any other purpose that we de deemed uh, uh, appropriate. But that's not how this reads. This basically says that all excess goes towards a tax refund uh, uh, fund. And, and there is no provision that allows us to spend anything in that tax uh, fund, tax refund fund. So I'm not sure that, I mean, even though the intent is there, I'm not sure it's reflected in the words of this bill. And so I just want to bring that to note. The other thing that I think that might be problematic, Madam Speaker, is that really we don't really know what the excess is going to be until usually after the third quarter, the third fiscal quarter. And so if in the example that we collect everything that we projected, that means that we would have had the ability to pay off all the refunds because say for example in this case, the, using the example that the prior speaker used, if we appropriated and adopted, adopted and appropriated $600 million, that includes the $125 million for tax refund payments. But we won't know that until the third and probably almost the end of the fourth, fourth fiscal quarter of what's going to be in excess of what we appropriated. And I understand the sentiment of the author of this bill as let's, let's not squander the collections in excess of what uh, we had deemed, well, what we projected and, and appropriated. Let's not spend it on frivolous stuff. Let's, let's stick to the issue, and the main issue right now is the tax refunds. The problem there, though, Madam Speaker, is that even in, we've known that cash management uh, in the, of the government, sometimes we do fall short in not being able to put some of the money in into this refund fund just because of the way the cash flows in. Most of the cash comes into the government usually around the second, third quarter because that's the, you know, the filing dates for, for taxes. And we won't really know what we're going to bring in until that time. So to me is like where, again, I, I, I fully agree with the intent of what we're trying to do here. But at the same time, I'm not sure that that is the reality that we can live with. Like I said, first of all is because we won't really know the excess until after the third, maybe even towards the end of the fourth quarter. And so all that money, well, if there is an excess, won't really be put into this count until that period. But if we had collected already prior to that uh, meeting of the, of the projections of the government, then the tax, tax refund fund should be all there. The $125 million should have been ready to be all paid out. And if it's not, then this kicks into effect. But that's the loophole. Because if there is an anticipation that there's going to be an excess, right, and we don't know it until the fourth quarter, right, then the administration or this government could actually spend everything that it collects all the way to that point of meeting the budget projections and use the excess to pay the tax refunds. So I understand the intent, but I'm not sure this accomplishes the tightening of our law to be able to do this. Whether or not I, I, I support this uh, amendment to delete Section 4, I have to think about it. Um, for a minute or two, but again, I'm not sure that the bill in its entirety, with or without this section, right, really accomplishes that task. There are also, if we put any excess into, if we put all excesses into this tax uh, refund account, what do we do about payments to vendors that need to be paid also? I, I mean, you know, okay, we put it in there, and then what, we're going to take it out once we realize it in the fourth quarter? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how this works. And, and like I said, I think there's got to be some flexibility, a little bit of flexibility. I agree that, right, we can't go back to the bond market and start borrowing for tax refunds. But I think that the 
the fallacy that if we pass this law that everything's going to get paid, I think that it is, is there. Because like I said, we could spend all the way up to the amount that we appropriated and then allow for all excesses to go into the tax refund fund. But that could be, that excess could be used towards the payment of the tax refund and still have spending going on along the way. And I'm not sure I've made, I, I'm speaking very clearly, but perhaps I, I'm not articulating as clearly as I'd like to, but I think that, that even this mechanism of this bill with about this section really doesn't provide the safety and security that the author of this bill was really looking for in terms of preserving uh, the priority of payment for tax refunds uh, through this legislation. But I just wanted to state that, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome, Senator. On the amendment, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Senator Rispicio, you're recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I certainly want to rise to first uh, recognize our colleagues that um, stood up and expressed some concerns relative to Section 4 and also some concerns about this bill in general. And I certainly uh, appreciate the sponsor's desire to want to prioritize tax refunds. Now, who wouldn't want to make tax refunds a priority? And as I rise to also share uh, my thoughts on the matter, I want to say that I would want to do it very cautiously for myself because I recall the time in this session hall where we were debating the bond borrowing for tax refunds. And the administration uh, at the time said that they were going to pay for this millions and millions of dollars that we were going to have to borrow in the bond market. They were going to pay for it with the increase in the military buildup and with the China visa waiver that's just almost about ready to happen. And certainly we don't see any um, revenue uh, increases from the military buildup to date. It's going to happen. It's happening, but it's not happening to the tune of the $15 billion buildup that they talked about initially. Also, with respect to China visa waiver, uh, Madam Speaker, we know that that's probably also right on the horizon, but we have not received any increases in revenues resulting from that kind of initiative. But at the time we were discussing borrowing money for tax refunds, I talked about the consequences of borrowing from the taxpayer versus borrowing from a bank, a financial institution, and I certainly recognize that when you borrow from a family member, the consequence is that you're going to lose that very uh, important relationship. Versus borrowing a car loan from a bank, you don't pay on that car loan, you lose the car. And that's how this whole bond borrowing scheme has been set up to where as soon as the, the BPTs come in, right off the top, they go to pay the bondholders. And, and at the time, I, I think in retrospect, I recognize from the taxpayer's perspective, it's all or nothing. It's my money, give me my money. It's my tax refund. You owe it to me, give it to me. And certainly that's what this body did in working closely with the Calvo administration. And I voted not only for the first bond bill, but I also worked hard in a bipartisan effort to appropriate the $175 million uh, balances to pay for the um, required uh, tax refunds that need to be paid. You know, you take a look at that one instance where even when our action shows that our yes vote facilitated the processing and the payments of those tax refunds, how certainly my comments on the floor were misconstrued and politically uh, misconstrued and used uh, to my political disadvantage uh, to worry. I think it, uh, it cost me a lot of um, energy, a lot of um, conversations that I've had with individuals on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations with individuals on social media, how the administration took my seven-minute floor speech and turned it into a, a, an oppor political opportunity to say that I didn't support uh, tax-free funds, but in having those individual discussions with individuals, I, I'm very happy that they've come to realize that the best way to show support for anything is a yes vote, and my efforts certainly uh, lent to the payment and the facilitation of those uh, outstanding uh, tax refunds. Now we're at this juncture again, where in Section 4 it's presented as a means where if, if Section 4 were to be kept in the bill and if the bill were to pass and sign into law, that we can move toward paying tax refunds in a more timely manner, quicker than the six-month required court order. 
I rise with um, some reservation, uh, and I want to proceed cautiously to say that in Section 4, Madam Speaker, and colleagues, it also recognizes uh, any, any uh, projections above what were projected to be or actually collected, not only from the general fund, but also from special funds. And I know we've had this debate over and over in this body. I know that we've had the debate uh, as to whether or not the tourist attraction fund money should be used to pay tax refunds or whether or not the tourist attraction fund money should be used to pay for the outstanding uh, financial needs of the obligations of GMH to help provide some kind of um, bridge financing. You know, although we're one government, Madam Speaker, there's a reason why all these special funds exist. And these special funds, not only, uh, for example, the Tourist Attraction Fund or the Healthy Futures Fund or, or the Recycling Revolving Fund or Customs and Quarantine has special funds that they collect uh, uh, from the airlines to fund operations of customs and quarantine and border protection. So are we saying here in section four that, that whatever is collected above what was projected in any general special fund, whether or not that special fund is used to pay for tax refunds, no money shall be appropriated unless there's a notwithstanding uh, any other provision of law, specifically it will be this bill if it becomes law, that those monies shall be appropriated for those following purposes. I mean, and then the, the comment that, well, if this passes and you still want to appropriate, do a notwithstanding. You know, that, Madam Speaker, that puts all of us in a very precarious situation where, where we're going to have to pit the needs of the Guam Memorial Hospital up against the needs of the, of the taxpayer. And I'm not saying don't, don't use taxpayer money for government operations. As a senator pointed out in the beginning of the budget, we take off $125 million uh, that's supposed to be off the top, and, and that's for the entire fiscal year. And as money comes in, it's supposed to be set up in this income tax reserve fund that was uh, put together by the late Speaker Ben, and to his credit, got the courts to order the legitimacy of that law and how the administration has to follow it. And I recall the comments of our good governor when he was a senator saying that it was criminal, it was illegal, it was unconscionable to, to take taxpayer money and use it for government operations and to not fund uh, uh, government and, and to use it to fund government operations and not to pay the taxpayer. Now we're seeing those things um, happen today. We're in a better situation because it has to be by law, by federal uh, court order that they have to pay within six months. and. Certainly, we could strive to get this thing to be paid quicker. But the desire to even say that special funds should be used to pay tax refunds, I don't know if, at, if today the taxpayer will recognize that if GVB did not have the resources that it, that it needed to market Guam uh, throughout Asia and to bring tourists to come to Guam to generate that kind of revenue that's needed to build this economy in a way that could support all of these other um, mandates. If GVB weren't able to use this money, Madam Speaker, to promote Guam and, and increase the monies that come into the TAF, and instead, any TAF money that comes in should, would go to pay the tax uh, refunds. I mean, I, I don't know if that's what we want to do to the taxpayer anyway. So it's, it's a very, uh, it's a very precarious uh, situation uh, if bill, if section four uh, remains intact, it's a very uh, uncomfortable situation if section four is removed because it creates an opportunity for some, some narrative to say that the senators don't wanna prioritize the payment of tax refunds because section four was taken out. But what I'm trying to explain and what I'm trying to express is that there's we cannot use special funds anyway to pay for tax refunds, and if, if that's the desire, then it's gonna have to be accomplished in more than six lines that's trying to be accomplished here in this bill. We're gonna have to go in, and we're gonna have to say that the TAF money, the tourist attraction fund money, shall be used to pay for tax refunds. We're gonna have to go in and say that, I don't wanna be interrupted now, Speaker. Speaker. You could say your point of information when I'm done. I just, uh, is it a point of information or is it an interruption? Yes, uh, Senator, I mean, you're right. What is the point of information? 
Uh, yes, I'm, Madam I'm, Speaker. I'm not pleased to defend whatever it is. Just what <laughs> is the information? That the, um, the section is for monies in excess of what was appropriated. So we're not taking money from the tourist attraction okay. fund that was appropriated. We're, t we're saying the excess revenue throughout the government. So it's not targeting a specific fund. It's not going to take money away from any specific agency that's not okay. already been budgeted so, for. So, Senator, I think all it, all that additional information, I would allow you also to, to close, uh, of course, in the bill to if there's any misunderstanding. Uh, so, that, that so that point of information just underscored the point that I'm trying to make, that in this session uh, and in prior sessions, we've used the uh, unreserved balance of the Tourist Attraction Fund to fund the needs of the Guam Museum and other other uh, important projects that would promote tourism. So if the sponsor of the bill is saying point of information, we're talking about monies that have not yet been appropriated. Well, in, in the session agenda alone, and I know we're not supposed to talk about other bills before us, but there's an appropriation of 250000 from the unreserved fund balance of the Healthy Future Fund. Theoretically, if this bill were signed into law and it was the law today, we couldn't even do anything to help mitigate the needs of the Department of Youth Affairs. And so I don't really want to talk about this uh, because I know that the, that the ensuing effect would be that I don't support the payment of tax refunds, which, which I want to make clear that that's nothing further from the truth that I prioritize and I continue to support the, the monthly uh, payments of tax refunds. I don't think taxpayer money should be used to fund the government of Guam, but this thing goes beyond that kind of phil philosophical commitment to say that beyond that $125 million that's supposed to be put in reserve, any money's collected above or and beyond, whether it's general fund or special fund, so we just shut the government down. And so when we shut the government down, we missed out, we missed opportunities to, to meet the needs of the hospital, to meet the needs of the Department of Youth Affairs. These, this is happening right before our eyes. I mean, I understand that one of the reasons why we get criticized as an institution is because there's 15 of us and that we all have different priorities, different kind of thinking, and in one session agenda, you have an example of saying don't appropriate any money, but in the same agenda, you have, you have something that's contrary to what we're doing now. So, Madam Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to, to speak on Section 4. I want to make uh, my actions very clear that whatever I do with respect to Section 4, whatever I do with respect to the bill in the end, I'm thinking about how truly we can, we can prioritize the payment of tax refund and that we can, we can assist this administration in meeting that federal court order to pay these tax refunds uh, within six months of, of April 15, as I understand it. So I thank you for the opportunity to close and I hope that my actions will not uh, be represented or misrepresented by uh, any member of this body or any mem member of the public for that matter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Welcome, Senator. On the amendment, anyone else would like an opportunity to speak? Senator Blash, you want to close on your amendment before I call for the vote since there is an objection? Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I think, Madam Speaker, it goes without saying that every member of this body recognizes not just than what the need, but the inherent responsibility of being able to bring, to give back tax refunds. That's not a question, okay? And I, and I really don't think that it should be. My concern, again, going to the reason why I move to strike this section is the unknowns. It's making sure that, you know, Madam Speaker, we have to continue to be the ability to operate co continuously. Okay. You know, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation if, you know, we were reimbursed what was owed to us by federal government. But that's another question, story. And you know, you know that said is, is I, I I appreciate you know the, the comments that were by by previous speakers. And even from the last speaker, um, in essence, if we were just to leave that in and this was to become law, no sense in going through the rest of the bills that are going to 
look to appropriate money for other things that we have on the session agenda. It's not going to happen. And you know, that's the great thing about this body. That's the great thing about this deliberative process. You put an idea out there, good or bad, put it out there. And let this be talked about. Let this be discussed. Let everything be vetted. So that at the end of the day, you can make an informed decision. And I applaud the author. I applaud, truly, I applaud the author of the legislation. Put the idea out there so that it can be vetted. Put the idea out there so that the concerns can be raised and we can actually discuss it. And this, what we're doing now is exactly that process. So I don't want any of us to be able to think that if we are successful in being able to strike this, that this was a ridiculous idea. This was a bad idea. No. This was an idea that was proffered. And as a result of this thing, this, this discourse, this is what the people of Guam expect from us. And I think the people of Guam also expect for us is sometimes, yes, in having to make the hard decisions. We've got to take a look at what our other responsibilities are. I don't want us to be put in a position where we are tied from making progress and in some cases revenue generating progress because we couldn't spend the money to be able to get that, to move that forward. Nor do I think that we want to be a part of a process where we're going to tie our hands because we can't work, work quick enough and fast enough to be able to respond to emergent needs. So I thank my colleagues for the discussion that we had on this. And I can appreciate, again, the proffer of this idea. I have raised my concerns and I voiced my concerns and I continue to voice my objection for section four. And again, affirm my move to strike section four from the bill. Thank you. On the amendment, which is to delete section four in its entirety, which is on page three from line six to 12, there is an objection, so all in favor for the deletion, please raise your hand. The amendment carries. You still have the floor, Senator, unless you're done. You're done on the amendment? Do you want to speak on the amendment, Senator? It passed? Yes. So that means section section four is deleted. So Madam Speaker, if section four is uh, amended, do the corresponding uh, special funds on pages two and three, do those get deleted too or? No, it's only section four is all we addressed. So on, on, yes, so on the motion now. So do you want to speak on the motion, Senator? On the main motion. Yes, on the main motion. You're, you're uh, recognized. Yes, yes, I may, Madam Speaker. And, and as I share the same sentiments as a lot of my colleagues that uh, rose earlier to speak in reference to the importance of making sure that every taxpayer out there receives their tax refund uh, funds. It's, it's, it's their funds. It's, it's um, what they put in and what they need to get back um, because they've overpaid. I, I have no problems there. My concern, uh, Madam Speaker, is um, I see on, on the bills 
on this bill on section three and four that the utilization of uh, including special funds we all know madam speaker that when special funds um, were created it was to do a specific mandate and making sure that that if we gave uh, the government the opportunity to work with special funds that that could not be co-mingled or used for anything else. There was a reason why, because though we know that health, safety, and education are, are the three most important factors, we all know that there are other ingredients in, in providing for the basic services that the government has to do for the community. And I, I just want to say that uh, putting in special funds will really uh, take a hamper to all the 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 reasons why the special funds were created so to that end um i i i guess i will look at an motion to delete uh special funds on page two line 13 and every corresponding special funds after that and then there would be one special funds on line three i mean on page three line one On the amendment, Mr. Vice Speaker. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I tried not to rise <coughs> earlier, but I call everybody's attention to line 11. On what page? Page 2. Any revenues projected or actually collected in fiscal year 2016 in excess of the adopted revenues for fiscal year 2016 pursuant to section 2 chapter 1 of public law 33-36 from any general or special funds that's how we arrived at the budget we're only talking about the excess and the reason why I didn't want to get up earlier is because nobody is sharing with me whatever it is whether it's re recreational or medicinal that makes them think there's going to be excess funds this year. Everybody's concerned about the other bills that were on this agenda are for things from 15 and 14. Some of the special funds in this year's appropriation bill were used to run the government in other departments. And it was necessary to be able to balance the budget. What this bill was introduced to do was to address some kind of pipe dream, at least in yesterday's cartoon in, in the PDN, of believing that there was going to be some excess funds this year. I don't know where it's going to come from. Thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Vice Speaker. On the amendment, Senator Respicio. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I certainly rise to recognize the comments of the previous speaker to say that if our appropriations chair doesn't believe that there's going to be any excess funds for 16, then why are we even doing this bill? You know, and for those of us who stood up to express concern about taking any excess of special funds and earmarking it um, for purposes identified in this bill, you know, and of course they're talking about unreserved funds for 15 in one particular case, but what does the future legislature do in fiscal year 17 when it was deemed that there was some excess special funds in the tourist attraction fund uh, in 16, and and how would, how would that have been handled then? So I guess that's why the the concern has been raised with respect to the um, practicability of this uh, piece of legislation. So, 
And, and if our appropriations chair is saying there's going to be no excess funds collected beyond what was projected, then it even makes a stronger argument to, with respect to whether or not the bill is needed at all. On the amendment, Senator Sir Nicholas. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, if, that, if those sentiments are um, to everyone's satisfaction, maybe we can restore Section 4 and pass the bill because it will be inconsequential. The reason why this bill is important, Madam Speaker, is because historically, when we look at every single fiscal year throughout this government, when we get to a period where we have projected, even just projected excess revenue, people jump up and appropriate those projected revenues before the dollar is actually even collected. We had a, um, a bill in the past, just as an example, where we were refunding a bond and we were already committed all the savings of the bond before the bond was even uh, refunded. In the meantime, the taxpayers are made to wait. The question with respect to the special funds um, pursuant to the amendment, Madam Speaker, is that you know it's constantly being hinted in s some of the discussions here that the, the um, special funds are needed in order for us to be able to accomplish the objectives that are to be funded by those special funds. And that's absolutely correct, Madam Speaker. But those objectives are supposed to have been met when we passed the budget back in October. What this bill addresses, as was read by the Vice Speaker, is excess revenue. And we've seen, in prior fiscal years, excess revenue. The Tourist Attraction Fund is particularly a place where we'll find excess revenue. And all of a sudden, as I remember in a, in a previous fiscal year, we just bumped up the appropriations to all the different groups as part of how to go about spending that excess revenue. In the meantime, the taxpayer was made to wait for their refunds. Now, if we have a budget that we pass in October, whether it's a general fund budget or a special fund budget, that budget is supposed to be sufficient to meet the objectives of this government for the fiscal year. What this bill says is that there's money in excess of that. If we budgeted 15 million and you bring in 17, that extra two goes into the tax refund trust account to pay refunds. How is that a bad thing? That doesn't hinder operations of the agencies dependent on the special funds in any way because those should have already been budgeted for in October. This is like a household, Madam Speaker, where we say, you know what, this is what the family's gonna bring in, but hey, day, wow, we got an extra gift from Auntie Chai. What are we gonna do with it? Are we gonna go pay down the credit card? Or are we gonna go and spend it on a nice dinner? Now families can make their own individual decisions, but in this government, Madam Speaker, we have to put the taxpayer first. We have to put the refunds first. People don't wanna be pigeonholed into that, but Madam Speaker, the reality is that that's what we gotta start doing. If we want to get ourselves to a place where we're able to say to our people, we're gonna pay your tax refunds within 30 days, or we're gonna make every available commitment with every extra dollar we have to get us there, that's what we gotta do. And if we don't wanna do it, then we can vote no on the bill. But if the special fund for the tourist attraction fund was adequate in October based on what was budgeted and appropriated at the time, then anything above and beyond that, Madam Speaker, is not necessary for us to be able to accomplish the mission of the agency because it was already funded. Everything above and beyond that is to expand it, perhaps, or to go and fund, fund something else, which we've all seen. But what all of us have all seen is the taxpayer being made to wait. And what we need to do to restore the trust of this government and to earn the, the, the honor of the taxpayer to continue to, in our good faith system, pay on time and not have to be hunted down through a collection agent or what have you, is to say, you know what, when you give us your taxes, we're going to give it right back to you as soon as we can. Whether it's a general fund or a special fund. That's what this bill is all about. That's what these sections are for, that's what this reference to special funds is all about. If we're adequately provisioning for the running of this government for the special funds in October, then anything above and beyond that, the excess, surely should go to accelerating the tax refund payments to our people. And in the event that we were to conclude a fiscal year and the excess wasn't determined until after we've closed the books in the fiscal year, 
those deposits go into the tax refund trust account. We begin funding it forward. So there's extra money in there. So that come this time next year, we're not saying we only have $235 in there. Until we start pushing our excess cash into what we can all agree are our priorities, and until we can really start doing that for our tax refunds, because we all want to agree that that should be the priority, we're going to keep having this problem. We saw this problem last fiscal year, Madam Speaker. But we're going to see it again next fiscal year. Until we get ourselves to a place where we're going to say, you know what, we're budgeting what the government needs in October, and anything above and beyond that, we're pushing it into the refunds for our people. Get ourselves to paying that within 30 days, and then we can go ahead and start beginning, ta beginning to tackle other priorities. But we really don't have any extra money for any extra appropriations, whether they're general fund or special fund, until we get ourselves to that place. And that's why I object to striking this provision as well, Madam Speaker. I really think that if we make these kind of commitments, whether we do it as a pipe dream or do it as a commitment, we're sending the right signal to our people. Perhaps there won't be any extra revenue, but in the event that there is, and we pass this, all of us here know where it's going to go. And that, I think, is a good place for us to start when it comes to showcasing to our people that we understand and we share the priorities that they have. We talk about tying our hands. We need to be tying our hands directly to the hands of our taxpayer. We need to be tied together with them because this government would not run general fund or special fund without them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You're welcome. Point of information, Madam Speaker. I just want our colleagues to know that this last fiscal year, though we only provisioned 125 million, we actually spent 155. In the previous year, though we only provisioned 125, we did spend 160. So every year we unfortunately have not been able to, to get a sufficient amount provisioned for tax refunds. I remember one session where we came back into the end of this legislature seven times because we couldn't agree or Adelaide wouldn't accept us increasing the, the uh, provision to 125 when we knew it was in excess of that. So there really will never be any excess because of the fact that we've under-provisioned for tax refunds for the, at least for, since I've been in this legislature. And so this, we've got to make sure that we, we set this aside. But just everybody to know that the 125 has never been sufficient, at least for the last several years. We've always had to pay out more than the 125. Thank you for that information. On the amendment, is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Senator Blas, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise in support of the amendment. For on two, two counts. One, first off, and we're speaking specifically about the special fund, right? Striking that up? Yes, since that's the, uh, and, but, the you amendment. But, you know, I, what I tend to do, Madam Speaker, and I think you can appreciate this as a former educator or as, or as an educator, is actually take the sentence and break it down to the different parts that it is. And so, when you say any revenues projected to be or actually collected in special funds, that's how I read that when we, when in, in that context. Projected to be or actually collected. Which one is it? You know, because as was stated earlier, you know, th throughout this discussion with regards to what budgets are and the budgets and as far as the projections. We can project the budget to be anything that it wants to be. So I'm a little confused there when you start to use that projected to be or actually collected. Because it, it broadens and expands that definition of what needs to be. And in that expansion, in broadening that, simply cuts it off.
and I can appreciate too, and as far as what the discussion with that we've always sh underfunded the uh, the tax refunds, but we've also also not been able to collect what we we truly spay, spend in compact impact reimbursement uh, services. Which, if you do the math, the DI math, would cover the amounts that are necessary for the tax refunds. It's amazing how we wouldn't be having this kind of conversations if we were having another type of conversation, and we we're pushing it. And not to say that, and I appreciate, I recognize, you know, the former speaker to this to this whole issue. It's been just as vocal as probably I have with regards to the issue. It's amazing, but if we were able to be able to recoup about $1.2 billion, how this discussion wouldn't even be on the floor. Again, I want to, pre again, applaud the author of the legislation. Maybe this will be the impetus to be able to move together towards that reimbursement. But in the meantime, with respect to, this, to the amendment and to the construct, the way it is worded, the way that it's going to be, that it is written, the way that it, it's meant to be, meant to be interpreted, projected to be or actually collected. That's the whole spectrum. And I can see the concern for the mover of the amendment as to why she wants to strike this from there. So, then I caution, is it, <laughs> not just the special funds, but everything else. It goes back to my previous discussion on the, you know, with regards to the section that we were successful in, in deleting. That this could just have just as much consequence. So, I stand in support of the amendment. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Vice Speaker, did you have a, another point of information? When the committee heard this bill, it was at a time when we understood that the administration was going to be getting someone to introduce a supplemental budget because there was belief that there was going to be that we had underprojected last year's budget and that there was going to be excess money, um, money in excess of projected or collected um, during the second quarter of this, I mean, sec after the second quarter of this year. And I hope that after I had my oversight hearing where everybody attended, that we dispelled that. But it was to address that, that possibility of either over-projecting or actually collecting that this bill was introduced. And so that was the reason why that was written that way. But either way, it was, it was going to be impossible. I just, it was to try to preempt any attempt at any su supplemental budget being introduced in, in the next couple of months because there was not going to be any rec uh, excess revenue, at least from where I sat, and the Office of Finance and Budget. Okay, so on the amendment, is there anybody else who would like to speak? Senator Winnie Barnes, would you like to close? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I promise I'll be brief. Madam Speaker, I I can understand and appreciate what's going on here and with the sentiments of, of the previous speakers, all three of them, in fact. But I, I, I want to share with you um, 
the reason why I, I, I did this amendment is because there was the reason why creation for special funds and special programs within the government of Guam was created. If we looked at a, stepped out of the box and looked at a bigger picture and probably literally tried to collect what was owed to us, like the previous speaker spoke about, compact impact, collecting the taxes that are due to the government right now that you and I know, based on three terms ago, four terms ago, that is over $100 million and trying to give the resources that is needed to the arm DRT that, that needs to go out and collect this. Maybe even looking at new industries and finding new opportunities to bring resources in. Like what we're doing right now with, 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 with looking at the cruise industry and home porting crew, uh, mid-sized cruise ships to come here and see how we can work with our brothers and sisters, even as close as the, the Mariana Islands. <laughs> Madam Speaker, when push comes to shove, usually we always come back into this body and regroup. But if you actually take away and utilize the special funds that might be taken here, you really, I, I think we'll, take away from the, the mandates of what's really supposed to be done. The Tourist Attraction Fund, Madam Speaker, you and I know that is probably the only fund out there that continues to flourish, that continues to grow. And that funding source is used to, to promote market and showcase Guam to the rest of the world. And I agree with, with the good vice speaker when he said that we had um, to use a lot of that, those funds to help pay, literally to take from Peter to pay Paul because several of the agencies really needed it. I didn't have a problem with that. As a matter of fact, I said, let's work together because we, we understand what it needs to provide for the basic services to, gov to, gov to the government, for the community, for the people of Guam. And I'm just saying that literally, it's like we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And it just depends on what angle you're looking at and what do we need to support and how do we need to promote or to safeguard or to protect or to give, it's, it's just like a family. You know, you budget, you, you give your kids a, a family, you have to give your kids money for food, I mean money for school. And if there's any extra, maybe on the weekend, you can give them extra to go to the movies or go somewhere to the store to go shopping. But if you don't have it, you don't give it. But if there's extra, and you know other things need to be helped at, or to do, or to fix, or to repair. Then you take and you give. But to take away everything, because of course you're the mother and you have to, you just want to give it up. And you don't want to reassess or, or, or work with the plan that you have today then maybe you can do that. But for me, Madam Speaker, it's, as a government, we, we already have set things in play. We already, well not in play, in order for each of the agencies to move forward to work their mission mandates. And when times are good, we can 
look into other programs. When times are bad, then we know we need to buckle down and tide. But I don't want to take, we can, from these special funds, because there was a reason why this August body created them to begin with. Anyway, Madam Speaker, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak, and I really do hope that my colleagues look at the bigger picture and making sure that we delete the special funds. On the amendment, which is on page 2, line 13, to delete the special funds, and also on page 3, to do the same on line 1. There is an objection, so all in favor of the amendment to delete special funds, please raise your hands. The amendment carries. On the main motion, so the author then you may close on um, on Bill 228. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I introduced this bill because of the financial realities that are just so apparent to us with respect to the efficient payment fund that we've created for income tax refunds. Of all the funds, general fund, special fund, that is the one fund that is always grossly underfunded. We talk about what we set up and, and put in order here in this government as far as the way things are supposed to operate. That fund is supposed to get a percentage of every single revenue stream, a percentage deposited into that fund to pay tax refunds. And that deposit is what's always neglected. It gets neglected every year. And the taxpayers made to wait. Wait because we're putting it into this other special fund. Wait because we're putting it into this other general ledger account. Wait, 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 but umbi because it's faster than it was before, be happy. When we look at the way revenue flows into this government, Madam Speaker, it becomes very, very apparent why they're made to wait. Everything else is funded first. They're, wait, they're made to wait until the last minute because we're going to use Section 30 to bail it out at the end of the year. And then that Section 30, which was supposed to put money into the government at the beginning, is now depleted, and we're waiting again until the end of the fiscal year for the next Section 30 stream to come in. We're never going to get past this, Madam Speaker unless we're going to be so disciplined in the next budget cycle that we're not going to appropriate Section 30 in order for us to actually have it carry forward as opposed to be bailing us out at the end. But we've already seen the governor's budget. He wants to spend 9% more, $81 million more. The Income Tax Refund Trust Account, Madam Speaker, needs to be our priority special fund. That's the one fund all of us in here should be saying that's where the money needs to go first. The law that we passed takes a percentage out of every dollar that comes into this government and requires that it's supposed to go in there. It doesn't. Everyone says we don't want to be saying that the taxpayer is being made to wait while the operations of the government come first, but that's the reality. 
when we don't deposit into that fund and we deposit into everything else. And all we have to do, Madam Speaker, because I've looked at the numbers, it probably will take maybe one, maybe two terms, at most two legislative terms, for us to just be more disciplined and make sure the money is flooded into the system so that we don't have this cash management problem. But we can never seem to do that because we always want to keep these things open-ended. so that we can appropriate for the next thing or increase the budget by X amount and say I'm fully funding this and I'm fully funding that while we all conveniently sidestep the question of whether or not the income tax refund trust account is going to be adequately funded for the taxpayer. The good thing, the, the, the good thing in all this is that the, the taxpayer is becoming so much more aware. I think that's what's creating this new environment here within the body where it's like, wow, you know, they're all actually understanding now. Their understanding of the standard should be probably within 30 days of a clean filing. And their understanding, because the media is keeping a good job of, of ever keeping everybody abreast of the fact that there is no money in that account. And we keep talking about it regularly on this floor about how they're supposed to be depositing that money into that account, that everyone's starting to say, well, why isn't it there? And then in the end, it does become a question for the policymakers in this floor, are we or are we not going to make that fund the priority? the tax refunds. Madam Speaker, I'm not a fan of borrowing. The governor brought it up um, during the whole pay raise issue when he came down here and testified about how I didn't support borrowing to pay refunds. We're not supposed to do that. This is what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be taking the money that comes into this government and putting it into that priority so that we have the money for the people when it comes due. We don't do it. We haven't done it since I've been here. The administration hasn't been following the law and making the deposits like they're supposed to. And because of that, the money's never there. And then creative cash management has to come in. We take from that, they, they don't deposit that money because they're going to go use it to fund this part of the government. Then they're going to go take money from the Territorial Educational Facilities Fund in February to catch up with the refunds. And so DOE is short in TFF, and so they're going to use GRT and income tax refunds, or I'm sorry, income tax returns to try and make up for that come March or April. But then that's going to probably short some other area of the government. And the shell game continues, the balancing act, Madam Speaker, continues. And in the end, everybody's made to wait. And if you're lucky enough to be the interest that is able to get a bill on the floor, that's able to get the eight votes that it needs to pass and gets the appropriation and gets the support of the administration to fund that appropriation, you can get moved to the front of the line. But the taxpayers made to wait. Especially now that the court has ordered that you cannot do any kind of expediting on any tax refunds. Everybody has to wait. First come, first serve. You wait for the money to get into the account, and then we're going to cut the checks. And we have until six months from the deadline to file. So I introduced this bill, Madam Speaker, because I want us to come to the understanding that if we have extra money, extra money from what we've budgeted in October, let's start putting it into that. And let's start paying these things out faster to the point where eventually we catch ourselves up and we're paying that within 30 days. And then we can start appropriating for other things. We can look our people in the eye. We don't even have to look them in the eye. They'll be coming up to us and saying, hey, thank you so much for finally getting us to a point where we're able to pay that in 30 days. Can you make it 29? <laughs> And I think that that's a good thing for us to strive for. The only thing it requires is the political will for us to be able to set aside the idea that we should jump out and appropriate for something that somebody's asking us to appropriate for and instead prioritize the money for the greater good of the community into the one fund that is constantly underfunded every fiscal year, the Income Tax Refund Efficient Payment Trust Fund. Let's get that fund fully funded. And until we do, let's not spend anything extra because we're not, we're not fully funding that one fund. 
we've already gotten a court order saying you can't take money out of that fund. We just need the political will to put money into it. The law is already there for the administration to do it. They're not. They say it's cash management, but the reality is the law is very clear. They're supposed to put a percentage in there. And in the meantime, this new legislation is another way for us as a body to say, beyond that, anything extra that you're projecting or that you're actually going to bring in, put it in there. And the reason why we say projected or actual, Madam Speaker, is because we've seen on this floor appropriations being made based on what's projected to come in. Oh, such and such fund is tracking to have a million dollars more by the end of the fiscal year. I'm going to appropriate that million. It's not even collected yet, and it's already being encumbered because it's projecting to come in. That's why we say projected or actual. Sometimes the money just shows up in the account because somebody came in and made a payment that nobody was expecting, and so the deposit is made immediately. That's an actual. A projected is when the tracking is coming in much higher and then we're appropriating those trackings without the actuals re being realized yet. We've seen both of those things happening. That's why we've got to make sure that we're provisioning for both. It was mentioned in some of the discussions earlier, Madam Speaker, that when we borrowed the bond to pay the tax refunds, now the money comes right off the top to go and pay the bondholders for the bond money that we had to borrow to pay the refunds. We're so able and so willing to take money off the top to pay bondholders or to pay payments that are obligated by the feds, but we have the most difficult time being willing to commit to taking money off the top of what's excess to pay our own people. We talk about compact impact. Oh, if we just brought in the extra compact impact money, we wouldn't be having this discussion. I beg to differ, Madam Speaker. If we brought in more compact impact money, we would be appropriating more money someplace else, and we would still be having this conversation. Because one thing about fiscal discipline, Madam Speaker, is it doesn't matter how much more money you bring in. If you don't have it, you're going to spend it wrong. People who win the lottery in the States win hundreds of millions of dollars. They go bankrupt in six years. Because it's not the volume of cash that you have that determines whether or not you're solvent. It's how disciplined you are with what you have. And that discipline is going to start with this body. It's going to start with the commitments we make and the priorities we set. And I don't really think it's such a hard thing to do. Because I don't think there's anybody in our community who will refute the notion that every extra dollar we have should go to paying out tax refunds faster until we're paying you within 30 days. Who's going to say no to that? Yes, there's all kinds of other things we can appropriate for. There always will be. There always will be. And that's why we need to prioritize. We need to determine what's going to come first. And if that decision is going to be left to you know, how you're going to be able to move your own legislation forward, then it's going to be politics versus priorities. But we can change that. I wish that we were able to keep the entire le um, bill intact, but unfortunately, um, some changes were made but I still want to at least get, get some of it through, you know, get half a foot in the door and begin moving us more closer to that kind of a reality. That's what I'm committing to. So I humbly ask my colleagues to please consider supporting the remainder of Bill 228-33. And as we go forward, if excess revenue begins to materialize in the budget, we can rest assured we're going to have a very, very, very frank conversation on the floor about how that needs to be taken into context with tax refunds, which are undoubtedly going to be made to wait, given the nature of the cash streams now, and given the inadequate deposit levels in the Efficient Payment Income Tax Refund Trust Account. But I thank my colleagues for considering Bill 228-33, and I humbly ask for your support. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Senator. On the motion to send Bill 228 to third reading file without any objections, so ordered. 
Bill 213. Senator Snickers, you recognize. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to make a motion to place Bill 213 in the third reading file and a brief moment to uh, speak on the bill. Uh, the bill would be as amended. Yes, Madam Speaker, as amended by the committee. Okay, so you may proceed, Senator. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just real briefly, Bill 213 is uh, an authorization for the University of Guam to be able to, on a very limited um, time frame, detail some of their employees into the University of Guam Research Corporation. This research corporation was recently created by public law, and um, what they need now is to be able to have some of their experts in the university go in and help the research corporation get up on its feet to become self-sustaining. So the bill would allow for um, up to two employees, no more than two, within the University of Guam to be detailed to the research corporation to get up and running and for those details to not last for a period of longer than five years. Once the research corporation is up and running, they'll be able to um, um, be self-sustaining and they won't be relying on details from the institution. But at this juncture, they just kind of need the support, the uh, expertise and support of their own in-house people to be able to get their uh, operation up and running on the research side. So this um, legislation is intended to uh, authorize the university to be able to make that uh, temporary adjustment. Mr. Vice Speaker, on the motion, the main motion. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. M Madam Speaker, Bill 2 and 3 as presented brings back lots of memories. I was the author of the bill that created this institution. I conceived the idea and talked the university into it. I think you and I had several meetings in my office with Senator Ben Pangalinen on the development of this legislation, the creation of this bill. <clears throat> and I remember even after those discussions with the late Senator Ben, he was not supportive of this idea until I assured him that it was going to be completely separate from the university because we were giving them all kinds of powers. We were, I mean, not all kinds. We were exempting them from every statute that we have every other government agency to comply with. They didn't have to comply with the merit system. They didn't have to comply with the procurement code. They didn't. They were out there, and they were supposed to be able to, to as quickly as possible, take advantage of, of investments that they could make or some ability to be able to move as fast as they could without government regulation. I was very proud of the creation of RCUOG. I was very disappointed when they started to assign people over. I was, I was really opposed to it. I mean, I'm happy that they're only going to be detailing two people, but a detail for five years is excessive. This is special legislation to take care of one or two people, or there is even two. And they should be able to have gotten up and utilized someone with expertise, someone with experience in putting investments together and operating it. I was approached about this, and I did not want to amend the legislation as this, this soon after, after passage. 
I mean, I support startup for a small period of time, I mean, uh, to assist, but five years is, is really excessive. So I don't support this legislation, amending it. Thank you. On the motion, is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Senator Spodon, you recognize. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I guess first and foremost, I w if I could just ask the author of this les uh, legislation uh, a question. And the question would be, whether or not the research corporation, the University of Guam Research Corporation, is a 501c3 corporation. Senator Snickers, do you yield to the question? I, I apologize. I'm not 100% certain. I do believe it is, but I'm not 100% certain on the answer to that matter. Okay. And I, and I ask the question because I do have a concern, uh, again, much following the, the previous speaker, in that right now what we're doing, I mean, we, we created this ability for the University of Guam to establish a, a nonprofit organization or a corporation. And now they're asking that um, a couple of the UOG uh, 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 personnel can then be assigned to this corporation and it will be paid for, it seems, by uh, I guess uh, UOG funds as opposed to corporate funds. Uh, and, and I'm not really sure that, that I'm very comfortable with that. Um, and I still don't understand the purpose. If they say that they need the expertise and the skills, I'm not sure that there's anything that prevents uh, the U U University of Guam to assist this corporation, considering this corporation is within the realm, uh, without assigning them over to the to to this corporation, because the question then becomes: Okay, if they assign these two or less employees over to the corporation, does that raise the possibility that those two employees who are, have a capacity right now, who have duties and jobs under the University of Guam, do they need to be replaced for the next five years? Will this cause any kind of an increase? Uh, in terms of the funding level that University of Guam is going to ask for because they assigned two of, the corp uh, two of their own employees over to this corporation. And as a 501c corporation, of course, that's a nonprofit status. And you, we can assume that the funding from this will be from private donations. And so I have a little discomfort in, on this as well. I don't know where I stand on it. I'm all willing to listen to any other arguments may be placed forward and maybe even the closing arguments. But if they can, I guess in my mind, if the University of Guam has the availability of two people to assign to this nonprofit corporation, what happens to those positions that these two employees are going to be vacating for five years? So I would like to hear a little bit further more, a little more discussion on this. And like I said, I'm not really sure that the University of Guam could not lend their assistance to the corporation without transferring their employee or assigning their employees over to the corporation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You're welcome, Senator. On the motion, the main motion, does anybody else would like to speak? Senator Nicholas, then. Hopefully you'll be able to answer some of the uh, questions and concerns. Uh, yes, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to my colleagues for the, um, the inquiries. <coughs> the, um, the question of whether or not the, the, uh, these details would adversely affect university operations, during the public hearing, the president of the university has assured us that, that they would not adversely affect operations. Um, they believe that uh, these individuals who they're going to be having assist the corporation would just get a better return on investment in terms of having them get that corporation off the ground because what, one of the things that its um, primary duties is to, is to pursue and administer um, additional grant programs uh, that are affiliated with the university. 
And so by having these experts um, come in on the university side and help them get their ship uh, up and running smoothly, um, the long-term benefits will be greater um, grant resources coming in at a faster and more accelerated rate, and they'll be able to uh, benefit the, um, the mission and the programs of the university versus um, you know, someone coming in from the outside who's not too familiar with how everything would synergize. So that's why they would, um, they would believe that um, having those, detailed, those individuals detailed to the research corporation will be more advantageous. And the, um, the duties that they're currently doing, don't get me wrong, they're not unimportant, but uh, it's just about trying to get the, the maximum, uh, out, uh, maximum benefit that they possibly can, uh, given the current um, startup stage of the research corporation. Um, the second question of why can't they already be assigned to the research corporation is that um, the, one of the main reasons why this needs to be an official um, legal authorization in public law is that if, the, if they detail these individuals, um, they're not able to continue participating in the government of Guam retirement uh, system that they're currently under. And so if they were to be detailed to the um, research corporation, um, the research corporation would be able to fund them, but they wouldn't be uh, under the Guam retirement system. And so they'd be losing out on being able to continue contributing and accruing their user service within the retirement fund. And so um, that's, the, that's the reason why this would probably need to be an operative portion uh, under public law versus just a, uh, a function that the university would do in terms of having these individuals um, vacate wherever they are at the university and go over to that, that side of the house and then vacate there and come back over to the university. Um, these individuals do want to remain a part of the um, original University of Guam uh, uh, structure and they want to go over and they want to help augment um, this aspect of the uh, operations so that they can uh, help the university um, expand that particular mission but they still want to be able to um, contribute their retirements and, and not lose out on, on what they've invested and, and the time they put in as employees at the University of Guam. Um, I believe that those are the two primary questions uh, from the retiring speaker. And, uh, you know, I wanted, to, I wanted to tip my hat to the president of the university and to these employees as well for their willingness to be able to go over and, um, and help this, uh, this fledgling idea get off its feet. One of the reasons why I was a big fan of the research corporation is, you know, a university's research uh, and the work that they do um, has tremendous benefits to the overall community. You know, you're talking about not only bringing in federal grants because it's not just all about the money, it's actually about the output and the work and, and the contributions to the quality of life of the community. And we're seeing so many interesting things being discussed about how um, there's uh, relations between um, certain dietary habits of, uh, of the people of the region and, and certain diseases. And, and so many other uh, interesting things that need to be further researched and expanded upon that are very unique to our community. We need to invest in research and development, um, not only uh, at the university level, but we need to encourage it at the private level. You know, we need to do a better job of it too here in our government when it comes to collecting data, analyzing it, and being able to use it as an actionable tool. Um, but, you know, these kind of things, they all start at our university. Um, I forget which... Uh, which notable historical figure said it, but you can always um, get a sense of the future of a community based on how well it invests in its institutions of higher learning, whether it's the University of Guam or the Guam Community College. And so expanding this research corporation, I think, was a very smart move for us to do as a body uh, when we did pass it into law. And I think that um, giving it just a little bit more support, being able to get it uh, on its feet a little faster by helping the university um, through public law, be able to get these experts in there to be able to get the research corporation up and running faster, I think is just another piece of the puzzle. Um, they're not asking for more money. They're not asking for an additional appropriation. They're not asking to spend anything else. They're just asking, can we, as an operation of law, have these individuals continue to remain um, as employees of the university but be detailed to this research corporation that is um, very much affiliated with the mission of the university? And. Uh, that's up for the body to decide, but I humbly ask my colleagues to please consider favorably. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You're welcome. On the motion to send 213, the third reading final, no objections, so ordered. Going back again to our agenda as the committee reports are coming in, Senator Rodriguez, you're recognized in 185. Okay. So, uh, Senator Tommy Morrison on 218. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move to place bill number 218-33 as substituted by the author at the Committee on Municipal Affairs, Tourism, Housing, and Historic Preservation. To the third reading uh, file, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to briefly speak on it. I just want to make sure that it's as substituted. You may proceed, Senator. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I first off would like to thank the committee uh, chairwoman, Senator Munyan Barnes, for conducting a public hearing uh, this month and working closely with my office to create a stronger bill that I believe will help address two main issues that were brought up by our, our southern residents and by village mayors during the public hearing. The first issue involves the need to promote greater public involvement with respect to how land in southern Guam should be developed. The second issue involves the urgency of creating a southern development master plan. A plan with the exception of a member who was absent received unanimous support of the 19th legislature, and not to mention the support of Governor Joseph Ada. Moving forward and building upon the efforts of Public Law 38- or Public Law 33-68, which was pushed forward last year by our colleague, Senator Frank Bross, Jr. Section one of bill number 218 as substituted seeks to provide additional opportunities for Southern residents to voice their support or opposition to proposed zone changes, variances, and the sale or lease of government real estate. For each variance, application, zone change, government lease, and other proposed project revealed by the, the Guam Land, Com Land Use Commission involving land in the municipalities of Agate, Santa Rita, Umatic, Mariso, Inarahan, Talapofu, and Zonia, the relevant Municipal Planning Council of Guam Southern Villages shall conduct a minimum of two separate public meetings pursuant to the requirements of the open government law. During the public hearing on Bill 218, Madam Speaker, Ideas were shared on how mayors should inform residents of upcoming meetings, at what hours of the day meetings should be held, and that village mayors and residents, residents of adjacent villages also be notified. At the recommendation of a former director of land management and territorial chief planner, Conditional use applications under the real review by the Guam Land Use Commissions were included to the list of actions that will be subject to the new public hearing requirement. As stated in the committee reports, sections two, three, and four of the bill as substituted were added for consistency purposes as these sections include the applicable provisions of Title 21 Guam Code annotated. Recently proposed large-scale developments in the municipal municipalities of Agate and Zonia have highlighted, highlighted the importance of developing the Southern Development Master Plan as required by Public Law 19-38, which was enacted in December of 1988. Unlike the residents of the South, families of our northern and central villages actually have a land use plan called the Northern and Central Guam Land Use Master Plan, which was created several years ago to guide growth and development in these areas. In order to help move the process of developing the Southern Development Master Plan forward, Section 5 of the bill proposes that a mayor from Guam's southern villages serve as a chairperson, chairperson <coughs> of the Southern Development Master Plan Task Force the mayor shall be selected from among the group of southern mayors authorized in Public Law 19-38 to serve as members of the task force. And finally, Section 6 was added in order to urge task force members to identify potential resources 
that may be available to support the completion of the Southern Development Master Plan. Madam Speaker, the de development of the Northern and San uh, Guam, or the North and Central Guam Land Use Plan was made possible with the help of the hardworking staff of the Bureau of Statistics and Plans. They were able to pursue federal grants to fund most, if not all, the requirements needed to contract a qualified consultant, conduct public meetings, collaborate with local, federal, and military agencies, and to prepare the final draft of the land use plan. Moving forward and with the passage of Bill 218, I'm committed to supporting Governor Cowell, the Bureau of Stats and Plans, the Guam Economic Development Authority, and other pertinent entities to ensure that res residents of our southern villages don't have to wait another 20 years for their government to figure out that a southern development master plan is absolutely necessary. Madam Speaker, while I support real opportunities to strengthen our local economy, I also believe that economic development across our island must be done according to a plan, an organized approach that has been publicly discussed by our community and government regulatory agencies. Perhaps we as a community could have avoided much stress and fears brought upon proposed projects that are in line had a Southern Development Master Plan be in place. Madam Speaker, I also want to as I'm not sure of many of us have been uh, watching what's been taking place uh, uh, with result with the proposed projects uh, over at Pago Bay, Zotnia area. Um, I wasn't at the meeting, but however, I took time to watch it on, on TV. I've also, uh, as a former director of the Bureau of Stats and Plan, uh, being on the ARC committee, participated in many of those uh, types of hearings. Uh, throughout my time or my service at B the BSP. And clearly, Madam Speaker, you can see just by watching how quickly, just from the start of that public hearing process, how there's this an immediate disconnect with the community. There's no one at fault uh, for that process. I mean, that's the process, that's the law, that's what they got to do. However, I, I have experienced right off the bat being in that process, and um, although uh, I serve at the direct, the, as director of the BSP from the village of Umatic, participating in a mini, meeting in Barragata, explaining to the people and residents of Barragata how this proposed project uh, may or may not impact their surrounding community environment or infrastructure. And yes, Madam Speaker, that is the process, but it, it is a clear disconnect uh, to, with our people. And what Bill 218 is, uh, in my view, is looking to do is from the forefront is that our, our mayors, our MPCs, have the opportunity to facilitate their own dis uh, public discussions, own public meetings at the forefront, wherever the proposed or developer is, and, and have these discussions separate, from, separate and from the land use commission process. I spoke to a couple of folks that we all know there, there is a line of, 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 of people willing to, to invest in our southern communities, and that's a great thing as we're seeing a, uh, uh, clearly in our census reports that there is a migration shift taking place from the south to the central or central north or off island. Um, and that's, there's several factors for that. But it all points to uh, the basis of what types of opportunities that are within our communities that would help sustain and help our residents to live in their southern homes. What this does, Madam Speaker, is if I was to show up to a meeting in, in Agate or Mauricio Umatic, or let, let's say just in Umatic, and there was a proposed or developer looking to propose uh, a large scale project, I think right off the bat, you know, showing up to those public meetings, seeing that my 
mayor or my NPCs as, as proposed by our mayors to the south would be in, engaged right away from the forefront with these uh, proposed projects, develop, development um, for or against, whatever it may be, at least there will be a, a clear connection with the community that the leaders of the community are, are facilitating these discussions. Um, does this not, one of the questions was asked, does, how does this impact the current ex land use commissions? There was proposals at the, uh, uh, the public hearing of even empowering the mayors to have a vote at the table at the land use commission process, throughout the land use commission process. Maybe that's something we can take, help, take up at a later time. But all I'm trying to accomplish here is create a better um, um, process at the village level that engage the NPCs, especially um, the residents that know these NPCs, those are basically the people, the pulse of the, the community, those are the people that are representing uh, every type of activity, programs, projects in our community. So it, should, it just makes sense that they should facilitate these types of very important discussions uh, within their community. So I asked Madam Speaker, uh, uh, that my colleagues, uh, Support Bill 218, and I thank you for the time. You're welcome, Senator. On the main motion, Senator Respicio, you're recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise uh, in full support of Bill 218, and I certainly want to commend the sponsor for wanting to do two things, uh, as I understand it. One is to get the development of a Southern Master Plan going and the sponsor believes that this is one mechanism to, to do that. The second thing is of course to give a greater voice to those residents throughout the South and to empower their mayors by providing this additional um, mandate that they have to uh, public hearings whenever there's going to be a variance application, a zone change or government lease or conditional use application and other proposed projects that has to be reviewed by the Guam Land Use Commission. And so what I rise to um, a point of question, and if, if the sponsor would yield, shouldn't we provide the same empowerment to those residents living in the central and northern Guam and, and expand this bill so that not only are we providing a voice for the southern residents, but also those who uh, live in the other affected areas. And although there's a development of a northern and southern I'm sorry, a northern and a central master plan, which the sponsor talked about, there's still, have we seen from time to time, there's still uh, the submission of application for variances that affect uh, part of, you know, northern or central Guam. And so I would ask the sponsor if he would yield uh, t if, there, if there's a need to expand this bill to provide for the same kind of empowerment and representation for other residences throughout Guam. Senator, do you yield to the question? Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield to the question. That concern was brought up at the public hearing as well, uh, and, and basically, there are, why are we focusing specifically in the southern residents? And we all know um, clearly from what we've seen, uh, what's being proposed out there in the movement down south were large-scale projects um, that uh, Absent a, absent a Southern Development Master Plan, um, it was really my focus to have this type of, at least this process in place for the Southern uh, leaders and NMPCs to, to have their discussions. I am certainly open um, to uh, expanding this further. I do understand there are, are still other large scale projects uh, taking place uh, in the central and the north, um, but at least with the Land Use Commission members and the MPCs and the mayors in the central and the north, they do have a, a north and central land use plans that provides for guidance and for decision-making decision -making process. Um, you know, um, so, but I, I'm certainly open to that. Uh, if uh, that was brought up by uh, one of our mayors from the central that uh, was seeing how this could also be expanded. So I, I know where um, um, that that's going. Um, we, we saw the discussions that he was just right on the border of a, a certain 
municipality and he was not notified as well um, or proper notification to a project that will certainly be impacting his community but I, I I'm open to to uh, uh, expanding this madam speaker I, I think it's important uh, to build upon a process like this that entertains our community um, at, at at the real level of where leaders are, 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 are meeting with their residents every single day about this issue. So. Thank you, Senator. Was he able to answer your question? Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and um, thank you to um, the gentleman from Pneumatic for being open to want to expand this uh, great idea uh, to want to not only empower uh, the those who live in the South through their respective mayors, but also those who uh, call Guam home regardless of where they live. And so in anticipation of um, the response that is open to that uh, kind of um, thinking, I, Madam Speaker, on page two, so I have several amendments which are quite simple. So on page two, beginning at line five, so the words, the munic municipalities of Agate, Santa Rita, Umatic, Mariso, and Iran, Talafofa, and Jonia, to replace those words with in Guam. So it would read project reviewed by Guam Land Use Commission involving lands in Guam. And then you would change the word Southern in line seven to respective. And so it would read the relevant municipal planning council of Guam's respective villages. So that's my first amendment. And then I have several amendments that will conform to expanding this idea uh, further. Okay, let, let's take this one at a time then. So on page two, line five, to delete um, in the mini municipalities of Agat Santa Rita, Yamatic, Meleso, Inarahan, Talafo, Funjotnia, and replace it with the word Guam. Is that correct, Senator? That's correct. And on that amendment, no objections? So ordered. The second is, on line seven is to delete the, the word southern and then replace it with the word respective. So it be respective villages. Correct, Senator? Correct. Okay. Correct. So on that amendment, no objection. So ordered. Thank you. Senator, Thank you may continue so on, with the others. Following on page, t uh, also on page two on line 25, to do the same for lines 25 and 26. And then the other uh, change would be replacing the word southern with respective. Okay, so then, uh, Senator uh, um, Ada, you have a question on that second amendment, or? Well, I know that the, um, I know that we have already voted on the first amendment on page two, line five there. I'm just, I'm just maybe if the author, because he's making these similar amendments, I guess, in the other uh, sections. But it appears then that now this Southern Council is going to be conducting public hearings on any variance application. They'll be spending half of their time conducting public hearings on variance applications that are taking that are being put in in Jigo, Tamuning, Sinahanya, and I think the intent of the bill was really uh, trying to protect. The, to, for the South to have this protection so that uh, now the Southern mayors are able to um, provide their uh, uh, position on uh, uh, Guam Land Use Commission uh, matters uh, as it affects the South. Now, of course, you could stretch it and say, yeah, what happens in Jigo could affect what happens in in Araham, that's that's rather you know that that's a stretch. So uh, maybe if if uh, so you know if we're gonna make those amendments throughout that now instead of just actions involving land in Agates and Arita in the south, that now involving land in Guam, so that you're gonna have these guys conducting meetings every day for everything else that doesn't affect them. You know, Madam Speaker, I think uh, I, I, I think what I'm what I'm doing here is just making it so that if there's a, a proposal in Marizo, for example, only the Marizo Municipal Planning Council will review that application for that variance that's going to affect Marizo. 
and that's determined by using the word respective villages, when that respective mayor. So it's not that, that the southern mayors are going to review applications that are going to be affected in Jigo or Dedido or... S what Senator, th this is what we're going to do. We're only five minutes away from uh, noon. So we're going to recess so that you'll be able to rethink and work with other members, whether one do this entirely or to create separate southern, central, and maybe a northern. Uh, but, you know, use this time then between 12 to 2 to have that discussion. And we will continue where we uh, have left off with uh, Senator Respicio. So we will recess until 2 o'clock this afternoon.